In today's video, we'll be making a decentralized exchange. In this exchange, you can exchange Ether for an ERC-20 token. Or conversely, you can exchange an ERC-20 token for Ether. This decentralized exchange, or DEX, is the minimum viable exchange tutorial created by Austin Griffith. The code for this project comes from Scaffold ETH, which is a GitHub repository with lots of tools for learning about and building decentralized applications. There are many projects in Scaffold ETH, including building an NFT, learning about commit reveal, building a multi-sig wallet, and also creating a simple DEX, which is what we'll be doing in this video. Let's first start with how DEXs work. Most DEXs use liquidity pools. A liquidity pool is basically a collection of balances of different coins, for example, the Binance coin and Dogecoin. A liquidity pool is initialized when users contribute tokens in equal ratios. For example, let's say we start a liquidity pool for Binance coin and Dogecoin. A customer can then trade Binance coin for Dogecoin. To perform the swap, the customer will give Binance coin to the decentralized exchange. The DEX will add the Binance coin into the liquidity pool and then take out Dogecoin from the pool and return that to the customer. Our decentralized exchange has three main requirements. First, we need a way to add liquidity into the DEX to create the liquidity pool. For our DEX, we will trade between Ether and an ERC20 token. So we need to initiate the liquidity pool with Ether and tokens. Secondly, we need to allow customers to swap Ether for tokens. Conversely, we also need to allow customers to swap tokens for Ether. Lastly, we need a pricing mechanism to determine the ratio at which these assets are swapped. For example, let's say a customer wants to trade one Binance coin for Dogecoin. After the DEX receives the one Binance coin, how much Dogecoin is the customer going to receive in return? In this tutorial, we'll be using an automated market maker called Constant Product. I've already created a previous video about constant product, which you're welcome to watch, because I won't go into as much detail about the theory behind constant product in this video. The rest of this video will be broken down into three parts. First, I'm going to create the decentralized exchange contract and the ERC-20 contract. After deploying those contracts, I'm going to add Ether and the ERC-20 token into the liquidity pool. Once the liquidity pool has funds in it, then we're going to swap Ether for tokens and vice versa. As we perform the swaps, we will experience something called slippage. Slippage refers to the fact that as the supply in a liquidity pool decreases, the trades become imbalanced because the tokens get more expensive. When a liquidity pool is first initialized, the ratios of the two tokens are equal. Let's say that the liquidity pool has two tokens A and B. Everyone wants token A, so people may trade their token B for token A. When that happens, token A's supply will become very scarce in the pool. The next person who comes along to trade token B for token A must provide a lot more of token B in order to get the same amount of token A. Slippage is not good. That's because when you swap tokens, you end up getting fewer tokens back than you had expected. The best way to avoid slippage is for the liquidity pool to have a massive supply. That's why customers tend to gravitate towards well-known exchanges that are used by many, many people and have many liquidity providers, which therefore means that the DEX has lots of supply. We will first get the starter code for this DEX from the Scaffold ETH repository on the branch challenge three DEX. This is a hardhat project, and in the contracts folder, we start off with two Solidity files. Balloons.sol is an ERC-20 contract for an ERC-20 token called Balloons with the symbol BAL. This contract uses the Open Zeppelin implementation of ERC-20. The initial supply is set to 1000. There's nothing fancy going on in this contract, it's simply a straightforward implementation of ERC-20. Now let's look at our DEX contract. Currently, the contract has a UN256 representing the total liquidity in the contract. It also has a mapping which maps from the address to a UN256. This will represent how much liquidity is held by each address. When a liquidity provider provides liquidity to the stacks by adding Ether and an ERC20 token, we will use this mapping to keep track of how much they've contributed. The constructor takes in the smart contract address for the ERC20 token. Since this address references the ERC-20 contract, we can use this token variable to call methods on the ERC-20 contract, such as balance of. Before watching this video, I strongly recommend learning about the ERC-20 standard and how transfers of ERC-20 tokens are made, especially with regards to transfers and approvals. The first thing I'm going to do is add a method to initialize the liquidity pools inside the stacks. The function takes in a number of tokens as an input argument. This will represent the number of ERC-20 tokens that we are going to add to the liquidity pool. This method is also payable, which means that when I call it, I can also pass in some amounts of Ether, which will be added to the balance of this DEX. 
On line 22, I'm first checking to make sure the total liquidity in the DEX is zero. On the next line, I'm going to set the total liquidity equal to the balance of this smart contract. This smart contract will receive Ether because it's payable, which means that the total liquidity will be initialized to the amount of Ether that's being passed in when this method is called. Lastly, I'm going to update the mapping to keep track of the fact that I've sent liquidity into this smart contract. So the liquidity mapping will show that my total liquidity is equal to the amount of Ether that I've sent in. The ERC20 tokens will be transferred from the caller of the method message.sender into the DEX itself. In the next step, I'm going to add a pricing function that will determine the ratio at which the Ether and the ERC20 tokens are traded. This function called price will determine the prices of the tokens. I previously already created a 15 minute video explaining the logic in this method, so I won't go into too much detail in this video. The main point is that this price method will determine how much Ether or how many tokens will be returned by the DEX during a swap. For example, let's say you want to swap Ether for the ERC20 token. The input reserve represents the balance of the asset that's being passed in. In this example, this would be the current Ethereum balance of the DEX. The output reserve represents the DEX's supply of the output asset, which is the ERC20 token. So in this example, the output reserve would represent the DEX's balance of that ERC20 token. Ultimately, this method will output the number of Ether or tokens that the DEX will give to the customer. For the full details of how this calculation is done, please see my previous video, which I'll link at the end of this video. Finally, we need to add methods that will allow customers to trade Ether for tokens and vice versa. In our first method, which allows the customer to trade Ether for tokens, we have a public payable method. Since the method is payable, the customer can call it and pass in some number of Ether. Method will then calculate the balance of the output reserve. Since the output reserve is the ERC20 token, we can use the token variable which references the ERC20 contract to get the number of ERC20 tokens that are owned by the DEX by calling the ERC20 method balance of. Once we have that token reserve, we can then call the price method. The price method will take in message.value which is the amount of ether that's being passed in. The input reserve represents how much ether this DEX has before the swap. Since the address's current balance already is incremented because it's payable, we have to subtract message.value from the current balance of the contract. The result of the price function will be the number of tokens that we are going to return to the customer. On line 41, the DEX is then going to transfer the tokens to the customer by transferring the tokens to message.sender, which represents the address of the customer. The method to swap tokens for Ether works in a very similar manner. For this swap, the input reserve is going to be the balance of the ERC20 token. The output reserve is going to be the Ether balance of the DEX. Now that we know the values of the input reserve and the output reserve, we can call the price function to calculate the amount of Ether that needs to be returned to the customer. On line 49, we transfer the Ether to the customer. On line 50, we transfer the ERC20 token from the customer into the DEX. When we deploy the smart contracts, we are also going to include a script to call the init function to initialize the liquidity pool in the DEX. I will initialize the liquidity pool with an equal amount of Ether and ERC20 tokens. I do this on line 34 by calling the init method with three to represent three ERC20 tokens and three to represent three Ether. This means the liquidity pool will be initialized with three ERC20 tokens and three Ether. In order for the DEX to take the balloons from us, we have to use the ERC20 method approve to give the DEX approval to take tokens. In addition, I'm also going to transfer 10 balloon tokens into my account. I will start the local blockchain instance by running yarn chain. I will also start the React app by running yarn start. I will also deploy the smart contracts by running yarn deploy. The React app, I can see the balance of my own account and the balances held by the DEX. 6319 represents the address of my account. I currently have zero Ether in it, which is why this is zero. My account currently has 10 balloon tokens in it. This is because in the deployment script, I transferred 10 balloon tokens to myself. The DEX is deployed at address E7F1. The DEX currently has three Ether in it, which is why if we click on that money sign, we can see the value 3.0. We can also check the number of balloon tokens in the DEX by calling the balance of method. I will copy the address of the DEX. By scrolling down, I can see the UI to interact with the balloon's ERC20 contract. I'll paste in the address of the DEX, and I can see that the balance is three. Now let's swap some ether for balloon tokens. To do this, I first need to get some ether into my account. I can do this by grabbing funds from the faucet. 
Now you can see my balance has 0.01 Ether. Let's trade 0.005 Ether for balloon tokens. How many balloon tokens do you think we'll get back? If you recall from our deployment script, I initialized the liquidity pool with 3 balloon tokens and 3 Ether. 0.005 is a very small number in comparison to 3, so we do not expect much slippage to occur. Therefore, at this point, if I exchange 0.005 Ether for balloon tokens, I expect to get back an equivalent number of balloon tokens, 0.005. I'll press this green star button to multiply this by 10 to the 18th and then click send. You can see that the balance of my account was decreased by 0.005 Ether, and I've gained 0.005 balloon tokens. In other words, we just swapped 0.005 Ether for 0.005 balloon tokens. If we use balance of to check the number of ERC20 tokens in the DEX, we should expect this number to be decreased by 0.005. And we do see that happening, because the balance is now 2.995. Let's swap more Ether for tokens. This time I'm going to swap 0.004 Ether. The swap is successful because now our balance is 0.0009, and our account has 10.0089 balloons. Now let's try to get some Ether back by swapping some of our balloon tokens for Ether. For this swap, I'll demonstrate what slippage is. For a liquidity pool, slippage will occur when the balance of a token is running low. If the balance of an asset is low, that means that asset is in high demand. As users try to obtain more and more of that asset, it gets more expensive. The ratio at which the assets are traded is no longer 1 to 1. The ratio might be anywhere from 2 to 1 to 5 to 1 to 10 to 1, or even more, depending on the ratio of the assets in the pool. If you remember, we initialized this liquidity pool with 3 Ether and 3 Balloon tokens. As the, supply in ether, as the supply of Ether decreases in the pool, Ether will become more and more expensive, meaning that it will take more and more Balloon tokens to get the same amount of Ether. If I try to do a swap which tries to extract all of the Ether out of the pool, the Ether will become super expensive. To demonstrate the slippage, I'll perform a swap with a number of Balloon tokens that is very high compared to the input and output reserves in the pool. Since our pool was initialized with 3 tokens and 3 Ether, I'll try to swap 3 Balloon tokens for Ether. Because of the slippage, I do not expect this to be a 1 to 1 ratio. When I swap in 3 balloon tokens, I should expect to get far less than 3 ether back. The message says that the transfer amount exceeds the allowance, so I need to increase the allowance. To do this, I'm going to approve the DEX to spend 100 of my balloon tokens. Now I will perform the token to ETH swap again. As you can see, I traded in 3 balloon tokens but only received 1.5 ether in exchange. This is because of the slippage. As I swapped more and more balloon tokens for Ether, the price of Ether is getting more expensive. There is still 1.5 Ether remaining in the DEX. To get the remaining 1.5 Ether, I'm going to have to trade in a lot of balloon tokens. Let's see what happens if I try to trade in 7 balloon tokens for Ether. For my 7 balloon tokens, I was only able to get 0.8 Ether. That's how expensive Ether is now. There's still 0.69 Ether remaining in the DEX. To get that remaining Ether, it's going to cost a ton of balloon tokens. Please stay tuned for part 2, where I'll cover the second half of the tutorial about liquidity. In today's video, we added liquidity into the pool using the init method. In the next part, we're going to allow anyone to add liquidity into the pool. However, people need to add liquidity at the correct ratio. The calculations get a little bit tricky, but that's also what makes it super interesting. Please stay tuned for part 2, and don't forget to give a like and subscribe if you found this video helpful.